Chapter 5, The Crazy Canopy. It wasn't long before Russell looked up at the canoe to see a dock where several large motorboats were tied. Javier helped pull the canoes ashore and quickly introduced himself to one of the boat captains, who'd take the team to the high ropes course. Hello, the captain tipped his old baseball cap at the teammates. When he grinned, deep wrinkles etched their way across his cocoa-colored skin. Russell nodded to the captain and sat down next to Dev. Mari held on to the edge of the boat, easing her way in. Sage stood behind her. She faced Javier, the captain, and her teammates. Let's remember this isn't a sightseeing tour, Sage announced. It's a race. Speed is a good thing. Then she sat down at the front plank by herself. Russell wasn't sure what Sage was getting at. Anyone who had actually read the wildlife packet knew that it paid to be observant. Sometimes there were extra challenges at the end of the race course, and paying attention could really help a team. Winning this race wasn't always about being first. Soon, the captain began to steer the boat toward a wooden jetty that reached into the river. Thanks, Javier told the captain before turning to the kids. You guys go ahead. I'll meet you here after you get the next clue. The teammates murmured their goodbyes and rushed off the boat and down the jetty. There were lots of signs that read, The Course in the Canopy. Even without Mari's help, Russell knew what that meant. He'd read about it in school. The canopy was the name for one of the levels of the rainforest. The top one was the emergent level. It was up at the very tips of the trees where harpy eagles could survey the forest, the treetops looking like fluffy green clouds. The canopy level was just below that where the thick leafy branches provided homes and food for all kinds of animals. The next level down was the understory, which was mostly tree trunks and vines. A few animals lived in the understory, but it was much darker and there wasn't as much food. The bottom level was the forest floor, which was always covered in shadows by the trees above. Prime predators like the jaguar and ocelot lived here. For most animals, it was safer taking cover higher up in the trees. And that's where the red team was headed, into the trees. They quickly found the starting point to the course. There, the workers, wearing matching course in the canopy shirts, handed them equipment. How do we know these will hold us? Mari asked as they all stepped into woven nylon harnesses. Russell noticed her hands shaking. The harnesses are strong, answered Sage, and carabiners, these steel loops, can hold hundreds of pounds. We just have to make sure they are locked when we attach them to the ropes. Mari glanced up warily. Nearly 100 feet above them, steel ropes stretched from tree to tree like telephone wires. Don't worry, Sage said, her voice surprisingly warm. We'll double check for you. We'll look out for each other. Sage was first to climb the ladder. It led to a wooden platform that was built around a thick tree. From there, they would complete several obstacles. Dev followed Sage, then Mari. Russell would be last. Russell got antsy waiting for Mari. He didn't want to use the word slow, but he couldn't believe how precise she was. She grasped each rung of the ladder so carefully it felt like he was waiting forever. But once they were, at, once they were up top, Mari seemed more at ease. She got across the cargo net without a problem and the tightrope. Now it was actually Russell who started lagging behind. Even though he knew it was a race, he slowed down to take it all in. For one thing, he could see a sloth only 10 feet away. It was just hanging there, upside down, with yellow claws that looked like they were straight out of a horror film. As he crossed a huge expanse between trees on a wobbly plank bridge, he stopped and stared at the world around him. It was entirely different up in the trees. The lush beauty shimmered in the sunlight. The sun blistered down from above with an intense heat. Now he understood the name. Like a canopy over an old-fashioned bed, the rainforest canopy covered most everything below. It shielded the lower forest from the sun and rain. Only small amounts leaked through. Russell saw macaws cleaning their scarlet feathers with curved beaks, a troop of spider monkeys plucking fruit from the branches, and lizards using camouflage to blend into their surroundings. They all called the canopy home. Over the crunches, squawks, and chatter, Russell could hear the familiar voices of his friends on the green team. 
They sounded far away as they, as they were as if they were nearing the end of the course. Russell, hurry up, Sage called from the next platform. For once she sounded more encouraging, less insistent. You've got to see this. The slim bridge swayed as Russell made his way to the other side. Check it out, said Dev. Russell leaned forward and focused where the others were looking, at a plant that seemed to be growing on one of the branches of a tree. It had lots of tall, spiky leaves, and in its center, there was a tiny pool of water. And there was something in the water. Is that? It's a bromeliad, Mari said. It's in the pineapple family, and it's amazing. It gets its food and water from the air, and it stores its own water, too. But what's in the water, Russell asked. They're tadpoles. They'll grow to be poison dart frogs like the one Dev found earlier. The frogs use the bromeliad as a nursery for their tadpoles. The tadpoles are safer up here than in the stream below. But how did it get there? One of the parents carries the tadpoles on its back, Mari said with a shrug. Russell took a deep breath. It was awesome. There was a tadpole living in a plant that was living on a giant tree a hundred feet above ground. Crazy! Hey, Russell! This time it was Dev. Let's go! Russell reached across the stirrup obstacle. It was like a string of six swings, all dangling from the same wire. It wasn't long before he had caught up. When he did, he realized they were at the end. The only obstacle left was a zip line that could take them, that would take them all the way from the treetops to the ground. Mari stared down, her front teeth digging into her bottom lip. It's not that bad, Dev told her. It's all based on gravity, and you're light, so you won't accelerate as much. Probably 60 miles per hour tops. Mari's teeth dug deeper. Sage turned to Russell. You should go first, she said with her usual authority. He nodded. If Sage, suddenly filled with goodwill, wanted to stay behind and coax Mari onto the zip line, he would let her. But he didn't want to abandon Mari altogether. He walked up to his teammate, who was fiddling with her braid. You'll be fine, he said, but he knew he didn't sound that comforting. And that's what Russell was thinking about as he whizzed down the zip line at breakneck speed, the wind whipping around him. He should have been thinking of swinging like a spider monkey from tree to tree or soaring like a fierce harpy eagle. Instead, he was worrying about his teammates getting down safely. That's when he saw something in a clearing. It appeared man-made, but it also seemed like it belonged in the forest, like it had been there forever. It looked like the combination of a stone cross and an ancient tree. He stared at it until it disappeared from view. When Russell looked back up to the zipline path, he saw the ground approaching. Once he landed, Russell looked around. The zipline left them farther inland. He had to search for the sign that pointed toward the river. Waiting for the others, he thought about the green team and how big their lead would be by now. It wasn't long before his teammates were all on the ground, taking off their harnesses. A new clue came in, Dev announced, holding up the ANCAM. Deep pink in dark water, gray in the clear. No need to see your dinner if you can always hear. Well, that's another winner, Dev said. I don't know what it is, but it says something about the water, so I think we should go back to the river, Sage announced. We'll figure it out on the boat. She headed toward the path to the dock. Dev glanced at Russell and Mari and then followed Sage. Wait, Mari said, almost in a whisper. Russell was the only one who heard her. I've almost got it, she said. She pressed her fingertips into either side of her head. Wait, you guys, Russell called. When he looked up, he realized Dev and Sage had already turned down the lush forest path. He could barely see them. You guys, wait a sec. He glanced back at Mari, who was still deep in thought. Just as Sage and Dev came back around the turn, Russell heard a low rumbling sound. What? Sage yelled. She didn't look happy. Russell didn't answer. He was trying to make out the sound, and then he heard it again. It was a growl, and now it was getting closer. Uh-oh, announced Sage. She stopped short. Between them was a jaguar club, cub, blue-eyed, spotted, and fluffy. The cub was too young to be on its own. The growl grew deeper. That's not coming from this little guy. It's the cub's mom, Sage called from down the path. We need to get out of here. You've got to run the other way, fast. Creature Feature, Pale-Throated, Three-Toed Sloth. Scientific name, Bradypus tridactylus. Type, Mammal. 
range, rainforests of Central and South America, food, tree leaves, twigs, and buds. What is the size of a house cat, lives upside down, and is one of the slowest animals in the world? The sloth. The three-toed sloth has long curved claws. Its claws are strong enough that the sloth can hang from them all day, even while it sleeps, which is a lot. The length of its claws makes it hard for the sloth to move in on the ground, so these animals are safest high in the canopy. Sloths often have a green tint to their long hair. It's because algae, the kind of plant, lives there. There are other three-toed sloths and other two-toed sloths, but they are all different species.